It's a funny thing about Oklahoma. I always seem to do well here. I don't know what it is. <laughs> I'm not from here, but I did come years ago to Tulsa, where I made a film based, on a 15, based from a 15-year-old Tulsa writer's uh, novel, The Outsiders, and the people... <laughs> people were so kind to me, and then and, and I felt so comfortable that I didn't want to leave, and so I stayed and made what we say back-to-back -back another film there in Tulsa, which was called Rumblefish by the same author. And, and a person that I'm here to honor tonight, uh, an Oklahoman, and uh, I, I, I don't really know, they didn't prepare, it just says watch Coppola speak, so I'm just gonna tell you. <laughs> but um, yes, I, I was a young theater student in New York and uh, had dreams of being a film director and, uh, and uh, more than that, I wanted to be independent. So um, myself and a group of young uh, ex-UCLA and USC students uh, decided to migrate to San Francisco on the basis that we would be independent there and we'd still be close enough to Los Angeles that we could uh, get the re great resources that were there. And uh, I was married, I had already two kids. I got married very young, which uh, uh, it was a blessing because I got, got, to, I got to be a 40-year-old and have a 20-year-old son, which is a, a marvelous thing. And anyway, we had a house in San Francisco. We were living there and I'm gonna tell you a story so amazing uh, in its coincidences I, I was there, I had written a script that I wanted the great Marlon Brando to be in. I had never met him, but of course, as a theater student in the 50s, he was, he was one of the great, the great trilogy was Marlon Brando, Tennessee Williams, and Ilya Kazan. They were uh, godlike to us. At any rate, I had managed to send this script to Marlon Brando. I had never met him, never spoke to him and I was hoping to get a positive response. And I was sitting at home on a Sunday, looking at the New York Times, and I saw this ad of a strange new novel that uh, showed a puppeteer uh, strings. It was called The Godfather. And I thought, hmm, that's, it was written by someone named Mario Puzo. And I thought, that sounds very interesting. It must be some intellectual Italian author. On, uh, and I was thinking about that, and there was a knock on the door, and at the door, were two fellows I didn't know really, but they were uh, Hollywood producers and they were making a film in San Francisco and I don't know why they knocked on my door. I think it was unusual to have a film person living in San Francisco. And it was uh, these two fellows, one of which was this young man named Gray Fredrickson. And they came in and I welcomed them. Uh, and so on that one day, there I was talking to these fellows, telling me they were making a film in LA, and the phone rang. And I answered the phone, and it was Marlon Brando. And I was devastated. I was uh, beside myself, and it was definitely that voice. And oh, it was Marlon, the uh, other. <laughs> he, he mumbled even then. And at any rate, he was calling to tell me that he, was, he didn't really think the script I had written was for him. It was, it was for a movie called The Conversation. But he basically turned me down. But I was so thrilled to be talking to him. And I talked to these two fellows, one of whom was Gray Fredrickson, whom I was just meeting. And uh, I said, well, Marlon Brando, that was Marlon Brando. And he just turned down this movie I wanted to make. And they, they said, oh, we were shooting in, in, in uh, San Francisco. We just thought we'd make our acquaintance. Now, the odd thing about this is that a little later, Gray Fredrickson and his colleague who was with him were given the assignment from Paramount Picture to do The Godfather, which was the ad I had seen in the paper on that day. And, uh, and they ultimately um, were my producers on the picture. So on that one day on that Sunday, I heard from Marlon Brando. I saw this, uh, this is a true story, uh, and, and met Gray Fredrickson, who was to not only go on and be a, a, a colleague and a producer of films for the next 50 years, and I'll tell you one, some reasons why, but all came together on that one magical day. Now, I, I actually turned out to do The Godfather, and uh, 
And I was, uh, I was hired because I was young when they figured I had no power, which means they could easily push me around because I had absolutely no leverage. I was Italian-American so that if the movie got a lot of heat for portraying Italians as gangsters, which it did, uh, that I, I would take the heat for it. And, and, uh, and also, I was a screenwriter, and the script was in very bad shape, and they figured they'd get a free rewrite of the script. But the funny thing about The Godfather was that as the time went on, the novel became more and more <clears throat> a big deal, and, and, and people really began to be interested in what this movie was going to be. So I was more and more out of my level of comfort, and they were beginning to wonder why they had hired me. And I was on the verge of getting fired every week. They didn't like my casting ideas. They didn't like this uh, actor that I had. I was the only one who knew of. And his name was Al Pacino. They didn't want him. And they didn't like the idea of having who, someone they thought was a has-been, Marlon Brando. Um, and so we were shooting like maybe the second week. This is another true story. Uh, and, and we were shooting, and we had shot Marlon's first day. And the word was that they, the big shots who were running everything didn't like it. They, they thought he mumbled. And they thought the scene, they, they thought everything was too dark. And, and this was a Monday uh, I heard this news. And I decided, well, what I'll do is it's right across the street where we had shot that scene. I can go back that day and reshoot it again. And, and, and it was Marlon's first day, and even he got nervous on his first day. So they said, no, 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 uh, you don't have to, that's all right. And my, my associate, uh, Gray Fredrickson, came to me and he says, Francis, they're gonna fire you on the weekend. That's why they don't want you to go back and reshoot it. And I said, Re they're gonna fire me on the weekend? He says, yeah. And, and, and the reason they fire a director on the weekend is because they figure if they fire him on the weekend, then they have time to turn everything around and on Monday with the new director. So it was Tuesday, so what I did is I, there were about 14 people on the crew who basically wanted me out. And so what I did on the Tuesday, because Gray had told me that they were gonna fire me that weekend, I don't know if he remembers this story, I'm sure he does, that I fired the 15 people <laughs> who were gonna fire me. Now, now, basically, it was a bluff. I had no idea that I had the right to fire anybody because I, I was clearly not in good shape on the picture, but I did it, and, and I took the crew, and I went back up into the office, and I reshot the scene that they had not liked so much. And, and I'm sure during the rest of the week, they were in calling up, can he do that? Can he fire anybody? I thought, so bottom line is, by then, they had to sort of wait to see whether or not the new footage on Brando was any better, so I sort of had stalled getting fired through the weekend because of this warning. And uh, indeed, on Monday, they said, oh, the th new scene is great, and the big boss of the company, his name was Charlie Bluthorn, for those of you who remember uh, such interest. He was the one who invented the first conglomerate. And he took me out to dinner and said, oh, you, you know, you're going to do great and all that. But the irony is that the scene that they thought was so much better the second time, in the movie, it was the first day that I put in. <laughs> so, so it goes to show. But basically, uh, the fact that this wonderful producer, who was always on my side and encouraging, even at a time when no one else was, uh, had given me that warning, basically saved me from getting fired from The Godfather. And I was so, uh, so grateful. But not only that, I mean, he was always so helpful that he went on for 50 years with me working uh, on uh, one nightmarish production after another because my whole career has been getting dug into ditches and then trying to climb out of them. Godfather, Apocalypse Now, you, you name it. It was a, a very exciting, uh, tumultuous type of uh, 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 career that I had. But, you know, in the long, in the long pull, it's interesting because, you know, I, I was always almost fired. And, and, and the truth is the things they're going to fire you when you're young are the same things that you get the Lifetime Achievement Awards when you're old. <laughs> but, you know... 
I, I will be ever grateful not only for saving my career, uh, but also for being such a loyal and hardworking. And also he could speak Italian, which of course always impressed me because I couldn't. And, <laughs> and uh, Gray had been sent to school in Switzerland, so he was fluent in Italian. The most amazing uh, person I have.